Hello there, welcome to Showcase. Art Basel has just wrapped up. And in this edition, the Art Fair's large-scale works made quite a buzz. Let's take a look. This enormous sculpture by Dominican artist Firole Baez draws inspiration from Haiti's Sanssouci Palace. Visitors can wander beneath its decaying arches, filled with details that reflect West African prints, 19th century motifs, and Caribbean marine life. It's one of 76 giant pieces that were on show as part of Art Basel's special exhibition called Unlimited. For its curator, this was a unique opportunity for artists to go as big as they want. Unlimited pushes the boundaries because um, we really build up the space that artists want. Uh, so it, it, we try to generate the ideal conditions, the perfect condition to show, show artworks. This is not always possible um, in museums or in galleries. So this is a special place for the art world community. And for the event's CEO, Noah Horowitz, this year's show was a truly global forum. The tenor and pace of the fair this year feels exceptionally strong. Uh, we're seeing young artists with brand new works um, being acquired at a pace, but also extraordinary secondary market positions as well. The audience is uh, predominantly European, but extremely global as well. We've seen a lot of uh, collectors from Asia, from, from the US, from Canada, from South America. It's a truly global forum uh, and a truly global coming together. As for the exhibitors, they've reported strong sales to institutions and private collectors across the world. I think this year more than ever, what we're seeing is the connoisseur buyer. It's the buyer that knows what they want, they know what year they want it to be from, and it's our job to have it here and present it to them. And so we've had great sales, we've had institutional sales, we are thrilled with the results, and in a way what it kind of, it's quite reassuring, because what it reminds you of are the qualities of why we're doing what we do. The fair attracted more than 80,000 people throughout the week and reported notable sales. Although the end result is pleasing, Horowitz says for the future, the event must evolve to keep up with an increasingly digital art world. Salvador Dali might be one of the pioneers of surrealism, but not many people know he partly owed that success to his wife Gala. And that's exactly what the biopic Dali Land is about. This is very important. In 1973, a young gallery assistant goes to help the aging genius Salvador Dali prepare for a big show in New York. Along the way, he also gets to witness the strange relationship between Dali and his wife Gala. She's credited for seeing the spark in Dali and supporting him through distractions and mental breakdowns on his way to becoming a prolific artist. Do you use anything in your hand for your job? Ben Kingsley plays Dali and Barbara Sukoa plays Gala in the biopic Dali Land. It depicts how she pushed Dali to make deadlines and find new sources for money to support their extravagant lifestyle, but she was never quite recognized for pulling strings behind the scenes. How is it working for Dali? What it hopefully shows is that the energy that this person has, so that there were these women, and you could think, Jesus, she could have been a CEO of a big company today, maybe, or, you know, or something. And so she uh, she was definitely looking for something to put her creativity in. And uh, yeah, it's, it's very strange. They, they were really eccentrics and uh, they allowed themselves to be these eccentrics. And uh, I find it fascinating that today we sort of so often, you know, encouraged to talk things out in a relationship and to be to be nice with each other. And <laughs> these two volcanoes who just explode when they want. I need her. Sukoa says despite her research on the couple, she found very little on Gala, who was also a talented artist in her own right. I give you in Dali's autobiography, I found very interesting. He wrote about a piece of art that 
uh, gala had created. And I thought, that's actually good. That's, she could have been an artist in her own right, maybe. But she knew that she was not the genius that he was. And I think she suffered that she, uh, often that she was didn't get the credit. Because what she did with him was really extraordinary. Death. Dali Land has received mixed reviews from critics, but what they do agree on is the power of both Kingsley and Sukoa's performances in painting a commanding picture of a surreal romance. Nineteen fifty-three is the War of the Worlds put the spectacle in sci-fi cinema, but it also provided a modern update to its nineteenth-century source material. And in our movie almanac, Alijan explains how 1950s Hollywood used such films to exercise the United States' Cold War fears. As the Martians burned fields and forests and great cities fell before them, huge populations were driven from their homes. The War of the Worlds is based on H.G. Wells's book, which was published in 1898. But the movie adaptation abandons its British elements. This could be the beginning of the end for the human race. The location is updated to 20th century California. The sunny state is being invaded by Martians. The main character of the story is changed into an atomic scientist. And the invaders are fought back with nuclear power. These changes have their reason. The nations of the world mobilize their armed might. Sci-fi films of the time basically projected Cold War paranoia, such as outsiders coming to take over your homeland with nuclear energy emerging as a lethal weapon. Upon release, The War of the Worlds was received as the best post-war sci-fi flick to come out of the U.S. But it wasn't the only film to venture into this terrain. We still don't know what it is or where it comes from, but there's something there. The Day the Earth Stood Still brought another perspective to international politics. Global policing. The 1951 picture finds an alien coming to Earth to warn people that unless they live peacefully, they'll be destroyed, as their actions pose a threat to other planets. We have come to visit you in peace and with goodwill. Again, suspicious locals fearing the outsider trope is present here. Unfortunately, for identification purposes, the only photographs Mom, we have like are similar to this one hey, and do not show the man's face. But this time, the alien is not to stand in for foreign spies. According to the film's producers, it rather no represents manhunt. the ideals of the United Nations, which was founded in 1945. What is it you want? My name is Carpenter. I'm looking for a room. Oh, I see. Are you an FBI man? No, I'm afraid not. And today, as nuclear weapons programs raise global tension once again, these science fiction allegories show that maybe not much has changed since the previous century. Babylon 5 is returning to meet its fans, and that has the sci-fi community excited, as back in the 1990s, J. Michael Straczynski's acclaimed franchise and its contemporary shows had a major impact on small-screen storytelling and helped shape the genre's destiny. Captain John Sheridan, president of the Interstellar Alliance, is leaving Babylon 5 for what many expect to be the last time. In the road home, Babylon 5 commander John Sheridan travels through various realities to reach his native land. Fire this baby up. The feature is a new direction for the franchise. 
That's because creator J. Michael Straczynski decided to tell this tale in animated form. But he assures fans it will be the most B5-ish thing he's done since the airing of the original show. Destruct sequence. Destruct sequence? Are you feeling all right? This isn't just one of those I'm having a bad day things. I am totally in a mood to blow some stuff up. And fans couldn't be happier because the 1993 series tackled serious topics from racism to political intrigue in outer space soap opera form. Negative fleet command, the Vesta will not engage in support of illegal orders. Reviews praise how it brought a fresh take on ensemble pieces by allowing all characters in it to grow. Some critics believe Babylon 5 laid the blueprint for today's golden age of television. Negative. Might be waiting for us to get closer, get a clean shot, right? We're about to find out. 1993 also saw another series that lifted sci-fi to new heights, The X-Files. This was essentially the journey of two FBI agents searching for UFOs, which delved more into government conspiracy territory. At the time, it was received as a peak for empowering female representation. The show was also hailed for bringing a cinematic look to television. And all this made it what some call a cultural milestone of the 1990s. Are you ready for this? I don't know there's a choice. But given their influence on shows like Lost and Battlestar Galactica that redefined long-form sci-fi for the 21st century, it could well be said that both Babylon 5 and The X-Files also ended up paving the way of science fiction's future. The truth still lies in The X-Files, Mulder. The Immigration Museum in Paris is set to reopen after almost three years of renovation. The permanent collection has been spruced up and maps, photos, paintings and other documents tell a story that leads from immigration to integration. The Immigration Museum in Paris is looking for an answer to the question of how immigrants have shaped French society. Eleven important dates have been picked out for a chronological record. On each of these dates, we'll look at the key moments in the history of immigration. Today, one French person in three is an immigrant, the child of an immigrant or the grandchild of an immigrant. One in three French people is a considerable number. And this museum, in a way, is an archaeology of the present time. How did we become France? With an almost doubled gallery space, the museum uses new items to tell the many stories of immigration to France. Here we're really on a very historical tour, which is also extremely enriched in relation to what may have been there. 80% of what we're showing has never been displayed in the previous permanent exhibition. We used to have an exhibition space of around 1,000 square meters, which is now 1,800 square meters. At each stage, we're keen to include historical data, as well as documents, life stories with objects, donated by people who use them to tell their own stories, and contemporary works of art that weave their way through the exhibition, providing a different perspective. With nearly 600 works, documents, art and historical objects on display, the museum uses every means possible to fight the prejudice towards immigrants. Our aim, of course, is to reach out to everyone. And if people who today are not interested in this history, thanks to the museum, thanks to what we offer, become interested and know more about it, we'll be very happy. We're convinced that prejudice is often born of a form of ignorance. 
A number of portraits are also featured as a reminder that the people behind the numbers and statistics are real, each with their own struggles, hopes, dreams and stories. The Hamburger Bahnhof Museum in Berlin has had quite a history of change over the decades. First, it was a train station. Then, in the beginning of the 20th century, it was converted into a transport museum. And finally, in 1996, it became the central spot of Berlin's contemporary art scene. But its new directors felt that some change was still needed. New way of thinking about architecture and about exhibit making. This is how the directors of Hamburger Bachnow Museum described the building's rebranding as they took the old artworks down and revamped the permanent exhibition. The white walls are also gone and the building has been returned to its original, slightly industrial look. Art never existed in white cubes, it always existed in a context. It always existed in the context of experiencing life. Um, so art should not be removed from life, especially in a building that has encountered so many histories, some darker moments, some brighter moments. Sam Bardo took over as the director of the museum together with Till Felrath in March last year. Since then, they worked on changing the look and feel of the place. And so far, they haven't faced much resistance from the city's established art scene. I think that the Berlin art scene is one of the most exciting, dynamic, uh, daring and open to change art scenes that I've experienced in many, many cities. I think what makes Berlin very great is that it's a city where ideas can be massacred, but new ideas can, can you know, sprout out from what used to be. This is what defines Berlin. This is what makes Berlin super exciting for artists, for people who are looking for a fresh start, for a critical reflection. The curator of the permanent exhibition also believes the museum reflects Berlin pretty well. There are people from the whole world here, artists from the whole world. People come here and meet, then they leave again, but bring something with them. There is a constant flow of information, ideas, visuals that come into the city and then flow out again. And this flow is what this exhibition is about. Directors of the Hamburger Bachnow Museum are excited as the place is ready to welcome visitors with its new look. And they hope it won't be limited to being just an exhibition space, but also replicate its initial design as a cultural spot. An exhibition at London's Courtauld Gallery reveals some of the art world's most notorious forgeries. The display includes paintings, sculptures and decorative art pieces from the gallery's collection. And as impressive as they may look, they are not quite what they seem. Here's more. Spotting a forged piece of art is certainly not an easy task. Lately, technology has been very helpful, but it's not the only answer. And a lot of these fakes were uncovered through very close looking, through correspondence with experts, and then as well we have a lot of technological innovations that we've been able to apply as well, but they are not some sort of magic wand that we can wave over the drawings and give us a definitive answer, yes or no, usually. Um, they just contribute another piece to the puzzle, and when you put all the pieces together, we hope that you can get more of a complete picture. To the untrained eye, all these pieces seem quite authentic. Even experts on the subject were sometimes fooled. And the exhibition aims to get visitors to look again. Well, we want to encourage people to challenge their assumptions. A lot of times we see what we want to see and we want to kind of keep an open mind when we look at these drawings and to encourage people to look at the objects themselves, see what the objects are telling us and recognize that you do need to sort of also trust a little bit in what some experts might say and combine that with any research and technology that you can use and try to put all of those together to get a complete picture of the truth of an object. This virgin and child was presumed to have been by Sandra Botticelli when it was first discovered in the 1930s. But some scholars noticed it was too good to be true, and the virgin's face resembled the silent film stars from the 1920s. 
All these suspicions led to further investigation that revealed the piece was fake. We're having to kind of um, question everything that we, that we see, everything that we hear today. And indeed the point of the display is to get visitors to look closely um, and to try to figure out for themselves if something doesn't feel quite right. And indeed that's, a, that's how all forgeries have been, um, have been revealed. Someone somewhere said this doesn't look right and then further research um, happened. Forges resort to so many different techniques, like using chemicals to age paper, assembling frames with rusty nails, and painting on warm infested wood. Closer inspection of brush strokes can reveal painted cracks or watermarks on the paper. So, no matter how careful a viewer is, it appears that it's only up to experts to oust these masters of their crooked trade. A young Tunisian artist says she was bullied as a child due to her physical disability. But she says she's overcome that with her passion for art and self-love. Now she's truly really dedicated to highlighting the power of women through her digital portraits. Alfa Dababi highlights the aesthetic and moral dimensions of womanhood through these digital portraits. The exhibition titled V Like Venus presents the bright, brilliant and powerful sides of women from her perspective. This exhibition is a huge step in my career and I want to say to anyone who wants to achieve anything, they must work hard for it as it wasn't easy for me to reach this point. I work very hard and it makes me feel very happy to find that my hard work has paid off. The Bobby says she's been exposed bullying many times, but she never really let it get to her as she believes it's our dissimilarities that make each of us unique. Bullying is always there. You will always find people who say negative things to you or make fun of you, but it shouldn't become an obstacle because the only thing explaining this behavior is that these people envy you or want to be like you. Dababi now encourages women to be themselves and believe in their strength, and visitors appreciate the emotions that resonate through her work. I think the idea is very beautiful. We need female representation. As in business, we need women to become role models. Through her art, she portrays women in an imaginative way. When I see any of the paintings, I want to be in the shoes of the portrait woman. So her message is great. The 26-year-old artist studied graphic design, and when she discovered the potential of the digital art world, she became obsessed. She now wants to continue promoting women's rights with her work, and more importantly, inspire others to also pursue their dreams. It's been three years since the port explosion devastated. It had also wreaked havoc on the country's only modern and contemporary art museum. But now it's back in all its glory. Dozens gathered to celebrate the reopening of the gracious Sursak Museum. The institution had been under rehabilitation since the catastrophic Beirut port blast in 2020. The August 4 explosion was the most difficult period ever for the Sarsak Museum, which has been open in Beirut for 62 years and lived through the civil war. But the destruction caused by the port blast was the worst we've ever seen. 70% of Sarsak Museum's space was damaged, including ceilings and stained glass. But we were able to rehabilitate and restore it in just two and a half years. And that's an accomplishment. And it was all a joint effort with support from Italy, France, private organizations and UNESCO. The Sursok Museum always played a very important role uh, in the cultural life of, of uh, Beirut. And this is why when our Director General, Madame Mazoulé, visited Beirut uh, in August 2020, immediately in the aftermath of the blast, 
She promised that UNESCO would support the reconstruction of the main cultural institutions that were impacted. The structure was actually built as a mansion in 1914. After its owner died, it was turned into a museum 50 years later. It went through a major renovation starting in 2008. But visitors were only able to enjoy the space for five years due to the blast. And now that it's back, the history of Lebanon and its art scene is in the spotlight with a retrospective organized for the reopening. For some visitors, the whole experience is quite emotional. We were all looking forward to the reopening of the museum. It was a sad day. I was here the day of the blast to see what happened. And it was, uh, I mean, I, I had tears running down my eyes. It was so sad everywhere, but this place in particular, uh, because I run one of the largest art foundations in the region, uh, was very near and dear to my heart and all of my friends work here as well. And although the museum's employees are happy to be back, they're aware there's still a lot of work to be done in Beirut. The victims of the explosion are still waiting for justice. And that's why the museum points out it's important to remember what happened so that it never repeats. That's it for this episode of Showcase. I'm Esther Adrus from me and the whole team here in Istanbul. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.